Welcome back to Behind the Knife on YouTube. My name is Patrick Georgioff. I'm a trauma surgery fellow at the University of Texas in Houston. And today we're going to discuss airway pressure release ventilation. Yes, APRV. So APRV is the head scratching, anxiety inducing, very mystical ventilator setting that we all definitely don't know well, but do in fact love. It is, I believe, the great white buffalo of the ICU. And it's particularly important right now in this COVID uh, error uh, and uh, knowing something about APRV nowadays is definitely as important as ever. And so this talk is all about how we set up APRV and how to manage APRV. I'm going to teach folks with little to moderate ventilator experience um, how to do it. And so when we're done, I'm hoping, uh, really hoping that you will have uh, gained some degree of clarity on the topic and um uh, are able to jump in next time in the ICU and, and learn a bit more. So without a doubt, APRV is confusing. And like I said, it's ideal that you have at least some experience managing ventilators before you jump into APRV and at least some background. There's some other content on the YouTube or behind the knife YouTube site. Um, one top, uh, one uh, lecture called Ventilator Simplified. That's certainly the most basic uh, uh, lecture uh, and is a great place to get started on vents. And there's two other talks. One, uh, an APRV, or excuse me, an ARDS guideline. It's a bit shorter, goes through a, a, a typical a, ARDS guideline. And then a little bit longer video um, uh, that really dives deep into the pathophysiology evident and evidence uh, behind managing ARDS. And in the end, when it comes to learning APRV, you know, this lecture is really certainly just the beginning. You really have to practice setting, AP, uh, setting up APRV and managing APRV in, in real patients to become proficient in its use. And a good respiratory therapist is absolutely your best friend to learning uh, this, uh, this complicated ventilator setting. And I do want to thank um, some folks at the University of Michigan, Dr. Pauline Park, Dr. Uh, Christian Raghavendran, and uh, some of the most fantastic uh, respiratory therapists I know, uh, uh, Carl Haas and uh, Andrew Wyrock, who, who helped um, helped me put this talk together, reviewed what I put together, and made sure I wasn't talking any nonsense. So I'm, I'm very grateful to them for this. So let's get started by simply talking about what is APRV. So APRV is a pressure-controlled mode of ventilation, okay, that's defined by a very prolonged inspiratory time and a very, very short expiratory time and spontaneous breathing. So put another way, you could say that APRV is very much CPAP, okay, with the spontaneous breathing that comes with a CPAP setting, combined with short periodic releases of the airway pressure that's generated. Now, APRV prioritizes alveolar recruitment, okay? That's the most important concept here. We really want to recruit alveolar, and we do so by increasing the mean airway pressure. And this is along the lines of the quote unquote open lung concept of ventilation. So APRV allows for much higher mean airway pressures than more conventional vent, vent settings because we maintain this much higher pressure, longer inspiratory period. But it also has uh, allows us to have lower peak and plateau pressures. And APRV is most frequently used in, in hypoxic patients. It's primarily a setting used to treat hypoxia. And most, but not all these patients, are going to have ARDS. And I mentioned that APRV is a, it allows for spontaneous breathing. That's, that's, that's an important component of this as well, because spontaneous breathing may, in fact, enhance comfort of the patient. It may decrease sedation requirements. We want them to breathe spontaneously and contribute to the work of breathing. When patients do contribute, it engages their respiratory muscles, okay, which is healthy and good uh, for them uh, to maintain that strength to get off the ventilator. And it can, in fact, improve hemodynamics as well by generating some degree of, of negative intrathoracic pressure when uh, patients work to breathe in. 
uh, that can draw blood into the uh, uh, RV and increase your cardiac output. And we should mention too before we start that, that APRV can be confusing depending on what kind of vent you're using. There's different nomenclature. All right. Um, some of the biggest confusions are that on, on, on some of the more popular vents, such as a Puritan Bennett vent, APRV is actually called bi level when you set it. It's a bi level setting. And that's because what it, APRV really is just an inverse ratio bi level. But if you use something like a Drager vent, for instance, you're actually going to set it up via an, what, what's called APRV. It's going to look like it. It's going to say APRV, and that's going to be the setting you pick. So just one of the many things to confuse you. So this is really, uh, this is a, a, a pressure tracing, okay, pressure versus time of APRV. And there's four main settings on APRV. There's the high pressure, P high, low pressure, P low, time high, and time low. And like I mentioned, APRV is really this long, kind of typically high pressure CPAP, right, with spontaneous breaths mixed in with these intermittent, super duper short periods of airway pressure release, okay, shown by T low. Now we're gonna go through each of these four main settings and we're gonna talk exactly, talk about exactly how to set it up. What are the numbers we use? How do we set it up? What's the concepts behind it? In addition to that, I'm gonna show you a video to help hammer those points home and then talk about specific ways to troubleshoot APRV. For instance, how to change these settings to manage hypoxia or hypercarbia. Now this is a fantastic video from a website called uh, Recess Review that shows APRV in a set of uh, pig lungs. You can see inspiratory time is four seconds with a short 0.26 second expiratory time. The lungs inflate, they stay inflated, they stay recruited, and then for a very short period of time they squeeze down and air rushes out. But you'll notice importantly during that time low, it's so short, that the lungs don't fully collapse. They only partially exhale. And that is critical to keeping the lung, uh, the really the alveolar, alveolus open, the lung recruited, um, and this improves, with hypo improves uh, oxygenation. So this is really in words what we just uh, uh, talked about. So if you want to read it, uh, I'd recommend you, you, you pause the video here, uh, take a look and try to digest all this. Uh, this really tries to drive home the key points to APRV. Now there's only one slide on this. Let's talk really briefly about the data. Okay, this, this talk is not about the data. We could go on forever about the data behind APRV, but, but the take home points are that the data is limited. Okay, there's really no large trials that says APRV is, is the best or works so great. And the, these, these smaller trials um, uh, scattered over time here uh, do not really consistently demonstrate benefit. But the caveat to that is that APRV is, is really inconsistently applied across these different studies in a major way to the point where you, sometimes you're really not, just not studying the same thing. One of the more recent studies by Zhao et al. in uh, intensive care medicine in 2017 was, was a, well, a, a better done, a well done randomized control trial uh, that shows some positive findings. And this is a study that a lot of folks talk about, so it's worth reviewing, again, really briefly. The randomized control trial, 138 patients, and they compared uh, um, standard kind of ARDSnet lung protective ventilation strategies versus APRV. And what these uh, folks found is that APRV decreased ICU length of stay, there were more ventilator-free days, better oxygenation, improved compliance, and less sedation. So a very positive study. And if you talk to people who use APRV a lot, uh, they use it in their ICU a lot, uh, they will say anecdotally that, that this is um, oftentimes their experience, um, certainly in the right patient population, and really it's patient-specific, so in the right patient too. So let's move on to, to the settings. This is... This is Really what we're interested in is how to set up APRV. So let's start with just the core basic settings. These are, these are settings that you can use when you stroll up to the ventilator, you're switching someone over. These are safe, a moderate, good start uh, places to start when it comes to settings. So your, your high pressure, P high, um, is typically uh, set around 25 to 30 centimeters of water. 
Okay, uh, we'll get back into more details about that in a minute. We'll get into details about all this stuff in a minute. T high, generally four to six seconds. P low is zero, which is kind of crazy. And um, uh, we'll talk about how it can be zero, but how you can still generate peak. And then time low is super short, like I mentioned, usually between 0.2 and 0.8 seconds. And your release frequency, um, aka um, the respiratory rate, for, for lack of a better term, but probably more appropriately described as release frequency, it's usually between 10 and 12 or 14 uh, releases per minute. And when you get started, you want to put that FiO2 at 100% before we start weaning it down. All right, starting with P-high. As I mentioned, initial settings are around 25 to 30 centimeters of water. And P-high is, is where you want, you should set P-high to be your desired uh, plateau pressure. Now, if you're on, uh, typically this patient, patients will be on a more conventional ventilator setting before switching them to APRV. So if the patient is on volume control, for instance, you want to use the previous plateau pressure to determine what your P high should be. Now, to get a plateau pressure, you need to manually obtain a, a, an inspiratory hold. Now, depending on what kind of ventilator you use, it can be all different, but in the end, you end up uh, pushing a button, uh, the vent will deliver uh, a breath, and then before it exhales that breath, it'll hold, and it'll allow um, the lungs and chest wall, airway, et cetera, to come into equilibrium, and it'll measure that plateau pressure based on that volume of breath. And so that's called an inspiratory hold. And again, it's something that you have to manually do, usually just by hitting a button on, on the ventilator. Now, what if the patient's on a pressure control setting? Well, in this case, we want to use the previous uh, inspiratory pressure um, to set our P high. I do want to point out that this can be confusing for, for folks who are beginning to use the ventilator um, or learning about ventilators because depending on what ventilator you use, the inspiratory pressure can be recorded or shown on the vent as a total pressure or a delta. Okay, when I say total pressure, I mean uh, if you have an inspiratory pressure of, of, of 30 and the vent says uh, your inspiratory pressure is, uh, you know, a total, a total inspiratory pressure of 30 and the ventilator says 15 over a peep of 15, well, that's 15 plus 15 equals your inspiratory pressure of 30. Whereas some other types of ventilators will say 30 over 15. So you have to recognize the difference, whether it's a total inspiratory pressure or it's giving you the delta, and you have to add it with PEEP to see what your actual inspiratory pressure is. And when it comes to P high, uh, you want to consider uh, settings over 30 centimeters of water, especially in obese patients and folks with large uh, uh, chest walls. Uh, you, may, you may need considerably more than 30 centimeters of water, uh, and uh, you may, in fact, be doing the patient a disservice if you're not above 30. All right, so that's P-high. Um, again, P-high, in this, uh, this pressure versus time graph here, we see the P-high is set at 30 centimeters of water. Okay, it stays, the, the patient in, during the respiratory cycle stays uh, for the vast majority of that respiratory cycle uh, and, uh, in a T-high uh, uh, time frame in which P-high is delivered. So what about T-high then? So Typically, initial setting can be around five uh, seconds. Um, T high determines the release frequency. Again, the release frequency being those the time um, how often T low hits and those little tiny uh, short periods of T low where uh, um, the lung is allowed to exhale. Now, this gets kind of confusing because again, there's some vent specific things here. Uh, so, depending on which type of vent you are using, the release frequency may be set directly. For instance, you just you dial it right in. That's a Puritan Bennett vent, you do that. Or it could be set indirectly, like on a Drager vent. So, for example, on a Puritan Bennett vent, you're going to set the frequency and the time low, but you're not going to set time high. Time high is going to be calculated from your frequency, your release frequency, and your T low. So, for example, if you set 10 releases per minute and you set a time low of 0.7 seconds, your T high is going to be automatically calculated at 5.3 seconds. You're, going to have, you're not going to have anything to do with setting that T high. Conversely, on a Drager ventilator, you're going to set the T high and the T low, but you're not going to set release frequency. So if you set your T high at 5.3 seconds and T low at 0.7 seconds, this is going to result in 10 releases per minute. 
So this adds to the allure and the uh, confusion of APRV because it's different on different ventilators. Let's do a quick example of, of how these things are calculated. So here on top, you're going to see uh, your time low from 0.2 to 1 second, but really we stay within a range of 0.2 to 0.7 seconds, uh, and given respiratory rates. And so, for example, let's say we start with a respiratory rate of 12, maybe, time low of 0.5 seconds. We can calculate our total cycle time, okay, so 60 seconds divided by 12. Our total cycle time is 5 seconds. And we, when we subtract our time low, 0.5, from our total cycle time of five, we can calculate our T high at 4.5 seconds. So again, our T high takes up the majority of the respiratory cycle, keeps the pressure high, keeps the mean airway pressure high, and keeps those lungs recruited. All right, P low. So you set P low to zero centimeters of water, which seems kind of crazy, but you're actually going to generate auto peep on the APRV setting by cutting exhalation short. You're going to do this intentionally. You're going to do that by having T low low enough that the lung cannot let all the air out. Okay? That time low is so short that the lung does not completely empty and it doesn't collapse. So the generation of auto peep is absolutely critical to avoid this cyclic collapse of the lung. And it feeds into this whole uh, theory behind APRV that we want to do one big, really a, a big kind of long, gentle recruitment maneuver. Now you can determine uh, how much auto peep is generated based on how you set your time low by performing an expiratory hold maneuver. This is just like an inspiratory hold maneuver. Uh, but that require, it requires you hitting a specific button on the ventilator. Uh, the um, ventilator will uh, pause all, all processes right at the end of exhalation, and it'll measure the peep at that point, time point. Okay, so again, this is a manual thing that you have to do. You have to go to the ventilator, hit the button, and get this extra hold uh, of value uh, from the ventilator. And typically, uh, we want our, our auto peep to be around 10 to 15 centimeters of water. That can vary, but that's usually where you end up if you're doing uh, the right thing when you're setting your time low on APRV. So even though our P low is set at zero centimeters of water, we're actually generating auto peeps of around 10 to 15 uh, centimeters of water. All right, so again, time low, super duper short. So short that the lung is not able to empty fully thereby generating auto peep, thereby keeping alveolar stented, alveolus stented open, thereby uh, um, uh, maintaining uh, recruitment and oxygenation in these uh, patients. All right, T low. Now this is the, the big daddy. This is the confusing part of APRV. So we said initial setting of 0.7 seconds can be where you're at and we range from 0.2 to 0.8 seconds. And this is confusing because there are multiple ways to set time low and multiple ways to titrate it. So what I'm going to describe to you today is the Habashi method. This comes from Dr. Nader Habashi, uh, who um, is really credited with uh, um, bringing APRV to the masses. If you read some of his stuff, it's pretty amazing. And the way that we set time low using the Habashi method is by observing the expiratory flow graphic. And I'm going to show you how to do this in a video in a minute. But we're going to observe the expiratory flow graphic. Now, why would we observe an expiratory flow graphic? As I mentioned, we want the exhalation to be cut short. So we're looking at this expiratory flow graphic to adjust the time to ensure that exhalation is cut short. So we ensure that those lungs don't empty fully. And we're going to adjust T low to achieve a transition from exhalation to inhalation at 50 to 70% of the peak expiratory flow. Okay. Again, we are going to change time low to cut off exhalation early. And we're going to use this peak expiratory flow to identify where we're going to do that out. And that is usually between 50 to 75%, really 75% of peak estuary flow is where you want to be at. OK, 
Okay, 75, uh, the closer you get to 100% of peak expiratory flow, the shorter your time low. And you also need to take in a whole bunch of other things into account when setting time low. And this is why it gets even more confusing. You, even though you're on APRV, you still want to achieve ideal tidal volumes for these patients. Again, four to eight cc's per kg of ideal body weight, just like the ARDS and that stuff. So you need to change your time low, okay, again, by you looking at the peak expiratory flow to get to a tidal volume that's within that range, four to eight cc's per kg. This is also uh, the time that your CO2 gets dumped, right? This is when ventilation uh, occurs. Primarily, you do have diffuse, um, diffusive and passive ventilation of, of uh, excuse me, uh, exchange of CO2 uh, during APRV, but you're still dumping a bunch of CO2 out during this time low. And so you need to monitor those CO2 levels and, and in turn, keep an eye on the pH because among vent settings, APRV is one of those settings where you might end up with hypercarbia. And we're also looking at the desired auto peep. We just talked about P low. We set it at zero, but we're generating auto peep on purpose. So we're cutting off that breath at a certain point. And the shorter time we give it to the shorter time we give that lung to exhale, the higher our auto peep is going to be. And again, we want that auto peep to be around 10 to 15 centimeters of water. So what does this look like? All right. So here's our time low right here. Our pressure drops. And here's a here's a flow curve. Okay. So during exhalation, flow, your lung air is leaving the lung, all right? Leaving the lung, leaving the lung, leaving the lung until the lung is empty, and inhalation starts again, okay? Inhalation's on the positive side, of, on the uh, top of this uh, line, and exhalation's the bottom part of this line. And you can see that as you cut off um, exhalation at 50% of peak extra flow rate, right around here, 75% here, 100% here, we want to be right around the 75% of peak extraordinary flow. And when we cut it off early, exhalation is not allowed to occur. Okay, now normally exhalation occurs, you know, this is complete opposite of normal breathing. Normally your inspiratory time is short and your expiratory time is long. Okay, that's the natural way to breathe. And when that happens, exhalation occurs nice and slowly. It goes slowly back, flow decreases, and you get back to zero flow. You hang out here for a little bit, and then you breathe in again. All right, this is completely different. This is totally flipping natural breathing on a head again to maximize recruitment, to maximize oxygenation, to maximize mean airway pressure. And so we're cutting it off real early. And in doing so, uh, we're generating auto peep and getting right back to a quick inspiratory uh, uh, phase of this, um, the respiratory cycle. Now, as I mentioned, APRV is a spontaneous vent mode. Okay, it can be used in patients who are not breathing spontaneously, but ideally is used in patients who are breathing spontaneously for all of the benefits that uh, I talked about at the beginning. And in some ventilators, but not all, you have the opportunity to set pressure support. Now, pressure support would support those spontaneous breaths. And those spontaneous breaths happen during T high. And it happens on top of, for lack of a better term, P high. And in general, we do not add pressure support uh, to um, a patient's spontaneous breaths on top of P high. But oftentimes, if there's an option for tube compensation, we'll be, we will use this. So let's take a minute to talk about, um, or, or let me take a minute here to show you a video to hopefully try to bring these things uh, um, together a bit better. Set up APRV. Let's try this on a real patient and a real ventilator. So, this is a gentleman with moderate ARDS. He is completely sedated and not breathing spontaneously. And we're using a Puritan Bennett 980 series ventilator. One of the first things I want to point out to you is that on this ventilator to set APRV, we actually have to do it through the bi level setting. If we're using a Drager ventilator, this would actually say APRV. So, this is one of the many uh, confusing parts about setting up APRV. And we have our initial settings that we discussed earlier. So we have a release rate of 10 per minute, P high of 30, P low of zero, time low of 0 0.7 seconds, pressure support of zero centimeters of water, 
an FiO2 of 100. And one of the things uh, that we talked about earlier as well is that depending on which kind of ventilator you use, you may only be able to set certain parameters. In this case, the release rate and time low. Time high is actually calculated. And you'll see here with a release rate of 10 and a time low of 0.7, we have a time high of 5.3 seconds. If there were, this were a Drager ventilator, we'd be able to set the T high and the T low, and the release frequency would be calculated based on those numbers. One of the more confusing parts about setting up APRV is setting up time low. And using the Hibashi method, we set up time low based on percentages of the peak expiratory flow volume. Again, we set uh, a time low uh, to manage uh, such key features of the setting as your tidal volumes and the amount of auto peep that you generate. So we are currently set at a time low of 0 0.7 seconds. Let's find out what uh, percentage of the peak spray flow volume this actually is. So I'm going to maximize our flow scaler and pause it. When we pause our flow scaler, the appearance vent event is going to set us up right at that inflection point between where exhalation stops and inspiration starts. Now, normally, inspiration uh, during natural breathing, inspiration is short and uh, exhalation is long. And with that long time period, the lung will be able to completely empty until the flow is zero before inspiration starts again. That's not the case with APRV. We're intentionally using our time low to cut exhalation short to generate auto peep, to keep mean airway pressure up and to avoid atelectasis and de-recruitment. So at 0.7 seconds of a time low, we're at 47.9 liters per minute. And if I toggle over, you'll see that our peak expiratory flow is 98.3. So at 0.7 seconds, we're at roughly 50% of the peak expiratory flow. How about if I change the time low to 0.5 seconds? Here, after we paused our flow scalar, you can see that we're at 58 liters per minute out of 99. This brings us closer to 60% of the peak expiratory flow volume. And finally, how about a T low of 0 0.3 seconds? Here you can see our time low is significantly shrunken down we're at 68.7 liters per minute out of 99.2, and that gets us closer to 70 or 75 percent of the peak expiratory flow. Now, I mentioned that by playing with time low, we are able to influence the amount of auto peak being generated. So, how do you check auto peak? You do so by performing an expiratory hold. On the Puritan Bennett ventilators, this is performed by simply clicking this button and an auto peep will be generated. So even though our low pressure is set at zero centimeters of water, our total peep is actually 16. And this is generated at a time low of 0 0.5 seconds. We also use time low to influence our tidal volumes. Again, we want to achieve roughly six cc's per kg of ideal body weight. Uh, this patient is uh, roughly 6'2", and we are close to 6 cc's per kg uh, at a time low of 0 0.5 seconds. We're generating tidal volumes of around 550 mLs with a release rate of 10 and no spontaneous breathing. We have a minimum ventilation of around 5.5 liters per minute. So I hope that video uh, was helpful in kind of hammering home those points of our four main settings, P high, P low, T high, and T low. So let's get into troubleshooting APRV. So for the hypoxic patient, what can we do? So first, we could definitely increase the FiO2. That's easy, quick. Uh, should be a temporary uh, reprieve for that patient. But there's some other things we can do when it comes to these settings we just described. So you can increase recruitment and increase um, the amount of gas seen at the alveolar level by increasing the mean airway pressure. 
Some safe ways to do this would be to increase your pee high by increments of two centimeters of water. Now, importantly, uh, it, it may take hours to recruit patients on APRV, especially the sick ones. So you have to be patient uh, when making changes uh, to the ventilator and specifically when trying to treat hypoxia um, in a, uh, um, an ARDS or COVID type patient. You should also note that when you increase P high, you're also going to increase the tidal volume. Now, why is that? Well, you, when you increase P high, you're stretching the lung a bit more, stretching the chest wall more. So that when T low hits, the elasticity of the lung and the chest wall are going to be a bit higher uh, and are going to push out more air during that short time period. You can also consider decreasing the release rate in increments of one to two releases per minute, or if you're messing around with T high instead of the actual release rate on the vent, this could be in increments of 0.5 or so seconds. Now we should note that this is going to decrease uh, minute ventilation as well, so you have to keep an eye on uh, the um, certainly CO2 uh, and the patient's pH as well. And if the patient's hypoxic, we want to think about uh, are they atelectatic? Are they de-recruited? What is their actual auto peep? I want to check these things to ensure that we're generating um, the right amount of mean airway pressure and the right amount of auto peep. So we could potentially decrease our time low. Okay, we're going to do that by titrating our time low to ideally um, a cutoff of 75% of the peak extratory flow. Okay, this may help develop additional auto peep and help to keep the lung from de-recruiting. And certainly when we're dealing with high pressures on the ventilator, you always need to be aware of barotrauma and resulting pneumothoraces. Take a listen to your patient's lungs. Use the ultrasound, get a chest x-ray. Uh, make sure you're not missing a pneumothorax that's causing the patient to be hypoxic. And, and we want to also ensure we don't, this is all about the lungs we're talking about, but we need to ensure there's adequate, adequate oxygen delivery as well. Right? Is, there, is the heart working? Is it pumping blood? Is the cardiac output high enough? Is the hemoglobin high enough? These are important considerations in addition to what we do on the ventilator. How about troubleshooting hypercarbia? So one thing we can do, first and foremost, I think, is to decrease sedation if you're able to. We want these patients spontaneously breathing. Spontaneously uh, breathing patients will help to blow off uh, um, uh, some of that CO2. They're going to add uh, to the uh, work of breathing uh, that's being done by the ventilator. And we need to increase minute ventilation. We, we all know that. Increasing minute ventilation is the best way to clear CO2. And so one way to do this is to increase P high in increments of 2 centimeters of water. Um, again, to increase the stretch on the lungs, which increases the recoil during that short time low, to increase the tidal volume. We can also increase the release rate itself. We can do that in increments of 1 to 2 releases per minute. Or uh, you can uh, decrease your uh, time high in increments of one second, again, depending on what kind of ventilator you're on. Now, importantly, you're going to want to, if you're able to, if you have enough room without injuring the lung, you want to simultaneously increase P high. So why do you want to do that? Because if you're increasing the release rate, your mean airway pressure is going to go down. Okay? More time is being spent at that lower pressure. So if you can, to make up for that, we want to increase the pHi to maintain a good, solid mean airway pressure. Furthermore, uh, we can increase T low. This is the least desirable way to do this, I would say. Um, we can increase team low, uh, time low in 0.1 second increments uh, in order to increase the tidal volume to allow more air to be released. This may be nece necessary in folks with restrictive lung disease, COP, DEERS, etc., uh, but you do not go below 25% uh, of peak expiratory flow. This defeats a lot of the purpose of APRV uh, by um, increasing likelihood of alveolar derecruitment. Um, and finally, we want to consider permissive hypercarbia. Okay, sometimes these patients are so sick, so hypoxic that you're totally maxed out on the vent, you're doing everything you can to ensure this patient remains oxygenated just to keep him alive. And in doing so, um, we may be uh, allowing okay, hype, uh, the CO2 levels to go up. We may be per allowing for permissive hypercarbia. Okay? We're okay with that in order to um, 
to focus on oxygenation to keep that patient alive. And hypercarbia is fine. Uh, hypercarbia is okay as long as your pH doesn't drop too low. All right, so what's too low? Most people agree that you want to maintain your pH above 7.2. So once you hit 7.2 or below, you really need to start making some changes on the ventilator to blow off some more CO2. Or, again, if you can't do that, if you're, if you're really working on optimizing oxygenation and keep that patient alive, you may need to treat the patient to artificially increase the pH with stuff like bicarb or THAM. All right, how about work of breathing? We want patients to be breathing. We don't want them to be breathing too hard. And we don't want them to be not breathing at all. So if they're breathing too little, let's decrease their sedation. That's an easy one. How about if they're breathing too much? Certainly we can increase their sedation. Okay. Uh, the patient may actually uh, feel more comfortable when you increase the P high. That should be tried as well. You can also increase the release rate by decreasing the time high or just decreasing the release rate directly. And you want to forget, don't forget some of the other key features you, you always do when patients are on the ventilator, like managing their secretions, um, making sure you're suctioning them frequently enough, and considering things like bronchodilators to uh, manage restrictive disease. And lastly, how do we wean APRV? So when we get to about FiO2 of less than 40% or so, 40 or 50 percent, uh, and the patient's awake and breathing spontaneously, that's when we want to really want to start thinking about AP, uh, weaning APRV. Are they ready to do so? And to wean APRV, most folks use something called the drop and stretch technique, in which the P high is decreased in increments of two centimeters of water simultaneously with an, when, uh, and simultaneously you increase T high in increments of 0.5 seconds. Okay. Or you can decrease, equivalent to decreasing the release rate by approximately one release per minute or so. So again, it's drop and stretch means you're decreasing P high by two centimeters of water uh, at the same time as increasing T high in the increments of 0.5 seconds. So you're trying to get this patient closer and closer to plain old CPAP is what you're really doing. You're stretching out those release, uh, the release frequency, and you're dropping the overall pressure that's being used to support the patient. And you're going to progress to a CPAP type setting. Uh, you want to change over to CPAP um, when P high is ideally something like 16 centimeters of water or less, and your T high is greater than 12 seconds or so, which is five releases per minute. You can also transition that patient once they're to that level to a more conventional mode of ventilation, like a volume control or pressure control mode. Um, and ideally, you want to set it up so this uh, so that you can provide a similar mean airway pressure for that patient, and and again, tidal volumes in the four to eight cc's per kg of ideal body weight range. And from there, you're going to wean to extubate that patient. So that's where we stop. Again, I hope this was useful. Um, these notes, uh, there's a, I'll leave some show notes. Uh, in the uh, text below the video here uh, that you can link up to uh, that has all of this, essentially everything that's written on these slides written out in, in note form uh, so that you can uh, review those notes uh, next time you are dealing with a patient who is on a APRV. Again, I, I hope you found this helpful. Uh, thanks for tuning in to Behind the Knife on YouTube. And don't forget to get out there and absolutely dominate the day. <laughs>